So it just isn't an abstract word any longer. It now has the potential to act as a force on our senses from the inside out. Most everyone just naturally assumes that the environment expresses itself as a force on our senses and that the energy flow is one way. The environment acts as a force. We perceive that force through our senses and as a result affected by it. I touch an ice cube, it is cold. I touch something hot, it is hot. I see darkness and no sunlight and it is night. But what allows me to recognize all this as cold, hot night is the fact that the cause and effect relationship reverses. Meaning that once, once something is, let's say, installed in our mind and associated with these particular words or concepts, then the words or concepts take on the quality of the experience itself. Are you guys with me on this, sort of? So an abstract concept like word, just a word, it's just a word, right? Well, it's, you know, it's just, just a word. But it's not just a word, is it? It's now an energy structure in our minds that will have the potential to act as a force from the inside out. So for example, when we've, when we've learned to make distinctions in the charts in terms of how do, I, how do I even know that an opportunity exists? When these patterns come up, when we've learned to recognize patterns, it's like there has to be something inside our mind that, that causes us to even recognize the pattern in the first place. And it's, these, and it's these concepts or these structures that are created as a result of our experiences and associated with these words that act as a force on our eyes so that I can see what I've learned. Act as a force on my ears so that I can hear what I've learned. In other words, we learn to make distinctions in, this, in all these collection of forces that exist in the, in, the ways, in, the, in the various ways the environment can express itself. So that I know how to make the, I can, I can make the distinctions based on what I've learned about. If I haven't learned about it, can I make a distinction about it? No. It, it literally can be invisible to me. Something that we haven't learned or experienced can literally be invisible and yet be right in front of our eyes in terms of a potential or an opportunity. We'll get into that, how that works in a second, more graphically. So what I'm going to say is that beliefs are energy structures. Now, can energy take on shape or for, take on a shape or form? In other words, when I say that a belief is, is structured energy or an energy structure, does that make any sense to anybody? Does it? I guess maybe in the context that it can take, give, um, create an emotional impact on you, if that's what you're referring to. Okay. Uh, that's not. That's good. That's not exactly what I'm referring to, though. Can anybody, anybody think of uh, something in the environment that would be analogous to beliefs taking on, our, our energy taking on shape or form? What's that? Atoms. Oh, well, okay, atoms, but, but what, do you, what do you mean, Sean? The, the energy is there, and it's, but it's not actually a form that you can actually see see, but you know the energy is there. Okay. What would, what would be, what would be something analogous to that? A what match. Would, what? A match. A match? I don't know about that. Lightning. Uh, well, lightning? Well, but light, but yeah, you're right. Lightning is, yeah, you're absolutely right. Lightning is not a made of atoms and molecules, right? Okay, good. What else? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah? You have to go to provoke a emotion. When you, no, say, when you say energy structure, I think of the... Can structure take, can energy take on form? That's all I'm asking you. How, can energy take on form? Yeah. How? What ways? Tell me the ways that energy can take form. Electricity. Okay. And, but in what way? Light. 
within the body, it can change the chemical structure. What's that? Within the body, it can change the chemical structure. That's true, but that's not what I'm getting at. I'm getting at something else. Are my words structured energy? In terms of sound waves? I'm not making these, hey, you know, I'm not doing that, right? It's structured, I mean, even that's structured, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that, that, that what you're hearing is energy, correct? And is it not structured in a particular way? What about all, all the information that's carried on microwaves? All our, all our phone conversations that's transmitted through the atmosphere on microwaves, is that structured energy? Radio waves, structured energy? Can light take form? Can light take form and structure and have dimension? Television. Television? Or what about, what about, uh, what, what's that? Flashlight. Flashlight? What about laser, uh, 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 um, laser shows? What about holographs? You know, we take you can project a holographic image. You have got a three-dimensional image. What if this were a three-dimensional image projected into this space? You've got dimension, right? You've got you've got uh, height. You've got circumference. You've got width. I can measure it. But is it made of atoms and molecules? No, not this. I mean, if I'm saying this is a holographic image. So the distinction that I'm making, this is really important, is that if it's not made of, that, of atoms and molecules, then it's not taking up any space. This is really critical. You have to get this concept. That beliefs are structured energy, but they don't take up space. Now, how do we know that beliefs aren't made of atoms and molecules? Why do we know that? Well, no, I didn't think about this. Now we, no, how do we just know that they're not, how do, why, why do, why do, can we make that assumption? You know, I'm, I'm here, I'm making a statement, but, but why can I even make that assumption in the first place? They're limitless. They're, yeah, but why do we know that? Why can you make the, why do you, why are you saying what you're saying in terms of the limitless? I'm not going to disagree with that, but still, I, 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 is there any other is there any other tangible way to know that beliefs are not made of atoms and molecules? You can't see them. Yeah, you're okay. In other words, in other words, we know that 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 brains, let's say people's mental environments or brains have been dis dissected down to the really the, the the atomic level, and we know at least as far as, far as I'm concerned, I haven't read anything or heard anything where somebody has experienced somebody else's beliefs firsthand, meaning in their natural form as they exist inside our mental environment. Even people's memories can't be experienced firsthand. We know that scientists have learned that if you stimulate certain parts of people's brain, that they will experience certain memories that, are, that let's say, that exist in that particular region of the brain, that's where they're stored, but the scientist doesn't experience the memory firsthand. The scientist only experiences the memory based on how the person related the memory to the scientist. And as of yet, no one has, has you know, experienced what someone's memories are or what someone's beliefs are as a firsthand experience that's something that's made of atoms and molecules. Brain matter is made of atoms and molecules. The synapses that cause us to think in the ways that we do and how information gets transferred from one part of the brain to the other uh, is made of atoms and molecules. But the actual information that's transformed back and, or transported back and forth into different areas of our mind don't seem to be made of atoms and molecules. Does that make sense to everybody? They seem to be made, I'm just going to say, of structured energy. Electrical energy. Yeah, electrical energy. Now there's a really there's a real important implication here. That that if the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, and if beliefs 
and memories aren't made of atoms and molecules, wouldn't that imply that we have an unlimited capacity to learn? And what keeps us from learning everything there is out there to learn? What keeps us from making every possible distinction there is to make? Beliefs. That's right, our beliefs. What we've already learned. What's the force inside of us that says when we're, in, we're in, encountering something that we haven't experienced yet, but that's in conflict with something we already have experienced, say, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. What's that force inside of us that causes us to instinctively, I don't believe that. That's the force of the belief that you already have. That's right, the force of the belief that you already have. In other words, that is an inherent characteristic of a belief, isn't it? To immediately, and without any conscious thought, resist any other information that might be in conflict with it. Regardless of how functional or dysfunctional the belief may be. It doesn't matter what it is. That's just the way beliefs operate. But that's not what I'm getting at at the moment. What I'm getting at at the moment is that you understand this nature of, of energy that takes on structure and form. Energy that takes on form. You have to get, you have to, in other words, I want you to make the nature of a belief as tangible as possible in your mind. The more tangible that we can make it, the easier it is, you know, the easier time you're going to have to work with them. There's something else analogous to uh, structured energy that, that's probably the best example that there is, and that's dreams. Aren't dreams structured energy? If dreams, let's say presumably, if they're taking place within the confines of our, of our skull, how could that how could that be possible if it weren't for the fact that energy can take shape but not take up space? Because in dream landscapes, dream landscapes can be as real as physical reality. They can have all the dimension of physical reality. We can be in rooms, we can interact with people, we can just we can be outside. And yet how could all that be possible if it's all taking place inside of our mind if it weren't for the fact that energy can take form but not take up space? Does that make sense? <coughs> so do you guys have any questions about this so far? I'm on page two of section four. Okay. So what beliefs do is once we acquire one, they reverse the cause and effect relationship that we have with the environment. Meaning that instead of the environment acting as a cause, as, it, as, as it, it's expressing itself. Remember, the environment is just energy. We can, we, can, we can really just boil everything that happens in the external environment as simply energy expressing itself in some particular way, whether it's nature or other people. It's just the environment expressing itself in some particular way, acting as a force on our senses. Once we acquire a belief, the cause and effect relationship reverses, meaning that now what happens is that energy gets interpreted, interpreted in a way that's consistent with what we believe. It gets shaped. In other words, the force on the inside, the structured energy on the inside, acts as a direct force on our eyes so that we perceive information in a way that's consistent with what we believe. It acts as a direct force on our ears so that we hear information in a way that's consistent with what we believe. On our sense of touch, taste, and smell. So that when I, when I touch this, I know that it's a marker. I can feel it. That's the concept 
this structured energy in my mind of a marker so that I recognize what this is. And as a result, they also create our expectations. And remember what I said, what is an expectation? Yeah, a belief projected into the future. Into some future moment, whether it's, a, whether it's a second from now, a minute from now, a day or whatever. It's that we're expecting the environment to show up in a way that's consistent with what we believe. Just so I understand this concept of the, uh, the environment having, once you have a belief, the cause and effect, cause and effect relationship is reversed. If I don't have a belief and you uh, utter a phrase to me, if I have a, it, they're just simply words. Once you attach a belief to that, though, I can interpret that in a multitude of ways as opposed to just simply a phrase that's being projected at me. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at. If you're saying like a first-time experience? Yes. Okay, like a first-time experience, you'll just, you'll just take it in a way that, that directly relates to the way the environment was expressing itself. Right. So it'll it'll be there'll be a direct one to one relationship. Right. But now there may not be a direct one to one relationship if there's any similarities to anything else that you might believe. So there could be part of it that could be brand new and other parts of it that you might interpret in ways that are consistent with something that's already inside of you. So right. that you'll start making connections immediately. Because right. that's what our minds do. They automatically remember our minds are wired to associate, so we'll make these connections will if there's any similarities at all, our minds will start making connections to what we already know. And the reason why is because it's uncomfortable to be in a state of confusion. See, information that we can't make any distinctions about creates a state of confusion until we've learned to make certain distinctions. What does it mean? What does it mean? Now, when we know what it means, we're not in a state of confusion anymore. That doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that what we've determined it means is functional or that's going to help us in some way. But we'll get into that in a second. I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what do beliefs do? They manage our perception and interpretation of environmental information. They create our expectations. They determine what actions we take or how we decide to express ourselves. Now think about this. Behavior expressing ourselves requires energy. I am going to express myself and you are going to express yourself in a way that's consistent. Your outward behavior is, will be consistent with the energy that's inside of you. It's that simple. It can't be really any other way. And the energy is inside of you. How that energy is structured are what you believe or is what you, or is what you believe. Now you may not know what you believe, meaning that you may not have taken the time to say that or to extrapolate your behavior and say that, you know, for me to behave this way, this is what I need to believe. Or for me to, be to behave in this circumstance, this is what I have to believe. But that's not a very hard thing to do. In other words, in, in, you know, in the consulting, you know, coaching business that, that I've had for many years, that's exactly what I did do. You could just describe to me what you did, under what circumstances you did it, and it got to be very easy to extrapolate it into this is what you would have to have to believe to behave this way under these circumstances. It takes energy <coughs> to express yourself. And how we express ourselves is going to be consistent with the energy inside of us. To the intensity to which we express ourselves will be consistent with the energy that's inside of us. And, in, and in, in, in terms of our expression of our behavior, it will be a function of basically two broad categories. Our beliefs in relationship to these kind of genetically encoded behavior characteristics that we came here with. And how they interact together. This is, is this making sense to everybody? Okay.
So they determine what action we take and, and how we decide to express ourselves and also how we feel about the outcome. So if I'm interacting with the environment in some way, you can, you can say that there, I have a particular reason or purpose for doing so. Meaning that our desires, our needs, our wants, our goals, our aspirations, they're generated from within and usually fulfilled out there. Are you with me on this? No? Okay, what you want, what you desire, what you feel and believe you need, or what your goals are, all come from within here, right? Okay? From, let's say, a number of different factors that, that go into formulating what your goals are or what your desires might be. Your desires could also be, you know, a combination of your, let's say, genetically encoded, genetically encoded behavior characteristics, those kind of filters that we're born with, in combination with what we've learned to believe. Also, based, we're going to add another dimension to this, and that's that's our our inherent capability of being creative. And creative creativity comes from, let's say, let's instead of going where it comes from at this point, let's just say that that creativity is bringing more, bringing forth something that didn't previously exist. Now, it doesn't mean it didn't exist somewhere else in the world or somewhere in someone else's life or in someone else's mind, but, but there, we do have this inherent capability of being creative in that our thoughts are not bounded by what we've learned to believe. In other words, we can think in any direction we choose. And therefore, as a result, we can also be inspired by certain thoughts and feelings that cause us to think of something outside of something we've learned to believe and therefore generate a desire based on that. All I'm saying is that whatever it is, desire, want, need, goal, aspiration, generate from within and usually fulfilled out there. Meaning I'm going to take a particular set of steps to fulfill my needs. I'm going to have to interact with the external environment to fulfill my needs. I'm going to have to interact with the external environment to fulfill, fulfill my desires. Your desire is to be, let's say, a consistently successful trader, to accumulate wealth as a trader. That's a desire generated from within. What do you have to do? You have to interact with the market to fulfill that desire, correct? And as a result, you are going to take a particular set of steps to do that, correct? Those set of steps are going to be based on what? What steps you decide to take are going to be based on what? A function of what? No, come on. The set of steps you take in any given set of circumstances to fulfill your needs, wants, goals, desires, whatever your agenda is, is going to be based on what? Beliefs. Your beliefs. What you think works, right? What you think works. What you have learned to believe works. And then how you feel about the outcome of whatever steps you took in interacting with these external forces is also a function of what? What I've learned to believe. So probably, you know, when you look at sports, the dynamics of, 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 uh, of, of um, successful athletes, you've got athletes who you probably all have read about things about you know certain athletes have, have certain styles of self-talk or you know their their internal the internal dialogue that goes on between them okay so when one athlete makes a mistake they might criticize themselves and and call themselves name and other athletes you know just shake it completely off and 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 think very positive thoughts and, and get themselves refocused on what they need to do that those are based on beliefs that they have about what they think works or whether they even think it works or not doesn't even make any difference because a lot of times, this, certainly the self-criticizing beliefs were usually installed by other people anyway, and they won't really even have a choice in that, in that respect unless they've gone ahead and kind of cleared that stuff out, worked on clearing it out. They won't have a choice about what they're hearing in their mind anyway. But the point is, it is based on how they feel about the results of any particular action they take will be based on what they've learned to believe. So you can, regardless, see, so what I'm saying is that regardless of what outcome you get, you can learn, you can 
actually acquire a set of beliefs that allow you to think positively of yourself regardless of the outcome. It's just a matter of what you've learned to believe. What you've learned to believe about the nature of mistakes. Okay? So, beliefs manage the way we interpret environmental information. <coughs> they create our expectations, determine what actions we take, and how we feel about the results. You guys with me on all this? I'm going to give you some examples to, to really illustrate it. The, 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 the best example I can give, two of the best examples I can give you, one's in the discipline trader, one's in trading in the zone, but I really like, I really like the one where I was writing the discipline trader. This would have been sometime around 1986 or 1987. And uh, I'd been writing all Saturday afternoon, and, and I took a break and, and turned on the TV. And there was some locally produced uh, TV program in Chicago called Gotcha Chicago. And what the news station did was, was hire people to play practical jokes on some local Chicago celebrities. But in one case, what they did is they hired a guy to go out on Michigan Avenue and they stuffed his pockets full of cash and they gave him a sign that said free money today only. That's what the sign said, free money today only. And his instructions were to only give money to anyone who asked for it. All right? That was the instruction. Give money to those who ask. He went out on Michigan Avenue Okay, free money. Michigan Avenue is very busy. And how many people do you think asked for the money? You read the book, I know. <laughs> for those who didn't read it. Street car idea. Yeah, only one person approached them and asked them for a quarter for bus Now, remember I said a moment ago that you can tell what people believe based on how they behave? What would, what would, you, we can presume, let's make some assumptions. We can make assumptions that first of all, the people could read the sign that said free money today only. But yet nobody would ask. As a matter of fact, he became really frustrated because he didn't really understand what was going on. He thought that he'd be mobbed. And, you know, and, and really under, under probably, uh, under circumstances in which people did believe that money was free, he was probably putting himself in, in, in danger. Because people can really get, you know, people can act pretty weird when it comes to free money. Really? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he got real frustrated with this whole thing, and he even went up to somebody, some, some guy I assume was, was just, you know, he had, he had a suit on, I can't remember the case, and he walked up to the guy and said, hey, would you like some money? And the guy said, not today. <laughs> And they screamed out, well, how many days does this happen? And the guy just walked around them. The other thing I noticed was that people were, were, people were taking, make, you know, going out of their way to take a wide path around this guy. Let's break down the dynamics. What's going on? People don't believe it exists. Yeah. Like the same Who would give away free money? Yeah, can we, can we assume that, that the people that walked around him, first of all, <coughs> what, what, what assumptions can we make about money? Not what does money mean? Doesn't grow on trees. You have to work what hard, doesn't grow on trees. Work hard, doesn't grow on trees. Does, 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 can money have a, a pretty, uh, can have, let's say, can money have a great deal of significance in most people's lives? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a big attachment. Emotional attachment for most people. So, what can we assume? Now, in this case, we say, like, look, like we say that, that, that the environment was expressing itself in a way, in other words, what it was representing, the sign represented the truth. The sign represented the truth. 
presented the truth of what he was free. And yet, th this is what I was talking about, about how opportunities and certain distinctions about the nature of the environment can be invisible. The people that made the decision to walk around this person to actually take a wide path, what would that tell you about what they believed in that moment based on and based on how their beliefs were causing them to interpret that information. That's crazy. They believe there's no such thing as free money. There has to be catch. That's right. Probably no such thing as free money, and the guy could be dangerous and crazy. In other words, if the money were really free, he would already be mobbed. Otherwise, this guy must really be a nutcase, and therefore, I should take a wide path around him to avoid possibility of coming into contact with. Now let's look again, let's break down the dynamics. <coughs> I don't believe that free money exists, okay, that's basically what they're saying. In other words, the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, remember that? And even though free money is, is unlikely, free money is rare, in this case, it was real. It existed. And other than one person, nobody could perceive the existence of what was real from the environment's perspective. So if I'm operating out of a belief that free money doesn't exist, how will that act on my perception of information? Because what I have is, is, is a contradiction. I have a contradiction. I'm operating out of a belief that free money doesn't exist, and yet I see a sign that says free money. That is now I'm, now I'm dealing with information that's in complete conflict with my belief that free money doesn't exist. How do I reconcile the conflict? No, not, not in this no. case. No, no. Yeah. Well, people are gonna go on the street and start to start changing their beliefs, that's for sure. How are they gonna how, yeah, how are they gonna reconcile the conflict? Interact. Interact? No. You, know, you already said it. You already decided the guy's crazy. Oh, they listen to their own beliefs. They yeah. Don't, they don't you, they, no, you guys are, okay, I'm sorry. I'm not making myself clear. I've got a belief that says free money doesn't exist. That's my reality. I've got information in the environment that's in direct conflict with what I think is real. How do I reconcile this conflict between what's in front of my face, I can read the sign, Gotta ignore one of them. Changing energy. Yeah, I've got to rationalize it away in some way. In order to keep your belief. Not to keep my nothing's gonna to happen to my belief, believe me. That's <laughs> that ain't gonna happen. Now, my belief isn't gonna change at all. I mean people's <laughs> beliefs just don't change unless unless something very dramatic happens or they consciously do something about it. But I still have to reckon because I still have to reconcile the conflict. It needs to be you justified. Ignore it. Uh, what? You ignore it. I can ignore it, or I can again, like Jeff said, I can decide that the guy must be crazy because he believe free money could free money's big. I just can't walk away from free money. What What would happen if they decided to just take a chance that one day and go against their beliefs and really see if there? That's was right. We're going to get into that in a second, Sean. Okay, that, yeah, but th that's, you know, but, but right now we're just dealing with the people who saw the sign, could read it. What do they do about it? What do we do about it? See, these are, these are, these shouldn't be hard questions to, to answer, guys. This is something we do all, every day in our lives. Every time we, we, we confront conflicting information from our, our friends, our spouses, or whatever, we find some way to, to either argue our way out of it, right? Or and if we can't do that, what do we say? Well, you're crazy. Rationalize it away until you're yeah, until you're not in a state of conflict anymore. I've got a belief that says free money doesn't exist. I've got conflicting information I'm being confronted with. I didn't ask for this conflict, meaning that I stepped into it, stepped into it inadvertently. I'm walking along the street, and all of a sudden I see this sign that says free money today only. It completely violates what I believe to be true. What do I do about it? I say, well, it's not true. And as a result, this guy must be crazy. So 
So as a result, my belief that free money doesn't exist, manage my perception of the information in a way that's consistent with what I believe, my expectation was one of possible threat or danger, the guy I decided is crazy. My behavior is I take a wide path around this particular person to avoid encountering him, and how do I feel about the results? Good. Good, yeah, I did good, didn't I? Okay, I avoided a possible conflict with a crazy, crazy person. The belief ruled all of your actions. That's right, the belief ruled the whole process. It created an experience that was completely, let's say, um, out of touch with the reality of the situation. From the environment's perspective, the belief that we operated out of in that moment as an example, or the typical person that, 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 that saw the sign, the way the belief you know, impacted their perception, their expectation, their behavior, and how they felt about the results, created a reality for them, meaning an experience, a reality for them that was 100% or 180 degrees away from what was available from the environment's perspective. And interestingly enough, if you gathered those people together and asked them what they experienced, they would tell you what they experienced based on what they because their experience reinforced their belief. And if encountering the same situation again, what would they do? Same the same thing. Why? Because they didn't learn anything. Nothing changed. That's a little experience. If they, were, if they encountered someone with a sign again, they would experience the exact same thing. No, not oh, saying that they have feedback. No, no, no. We're not talking about feedback. We're just talking about, about how, what, I'm just talking about the impact that beliefs have on what we experience in relationship to what's available. The belief ruled everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. The belief rules. Exactly right. So now you can, you know, just, just a little side note. Now you can start to see when I say that if I believe that I don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money, or I believe that anything can happen, or I believe that it only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of my edge, am I not going to put a stop in the market? Am I not going to predefine my risk? Can I possibly do that if I have those beliefs? <coughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't make that mistake. I couldn't make that error. Or that every moment is unique, as long as I understand the real, the real implications of the word unique, this moment is not like any other, even though it may seem like it. See, this moment is unique, won't let me think that I know what's going to happen. It won't let me think that. And since I know I don't have to know, it doesn't become an issue, does it? Think about that. This, this moment is unique, won't let me think that I know, and because I believe that I don't need to know, it's not even an issue. So that I stay in the now moment, meaning what's the market telling me about its potential to move based on the pattern that exists right now. I just want to do a little reinforcement. Just so, is that all right, guys? That's good, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, again, if, if, if all these people, we, we, gather, we gather together all these people to, you know, get their feedback in terms of what they got out of this, they would relate the experience in a way that was completely consistent with what they experienced because the experience itself reinforced the belief, creating a closed loop. The belief acts as a force on our perception of information in a way that's consistent with the belief. What we expect is consistent with the belief. 
what we do and what we what we do is going to be consistent with the belief therefore the experience that we have will be consistent with the belief and therefore everything gets reinforced and nothing that might have that might exist outside that circle even has the possibility of, of entering into to break the circle Sean said, let's say for example you've got somebody that just takes a kind of what if attitude. What if? What if it's real? Or what have I got to lose to find out? And so this person just goes up and says, okay, give me 10 bucks. Pulls out a $10 bill and hands a $10 bill to the person. Now what? Now we should have the dynamics. Now what? What? We should ask for more. Well, yeah, yeah, well, I was going to get to that. Right. Wish she asked for more. Right. Typical trader's mentality is ask for more. However, what? Okay. Let's look at the dynamics here. What happens? You get free money sometimes. Okay, you get free money sometimes. What happens to this belief about free money not existing? It's, it's As an addendum to it. <laughs> we could. Sorry. Yeah, we pulled some energy out of it, didn't we? In fact, when you look at the nature of this particular concept, and how definitive it is, we can say that what we've really done is pretty much neutralize it. Because you can't say it doesn't exist. Because it does exist. It's not black and white. It might not be common, but it does exist. And so what happened? In essence, we used the vernacular, he changed the belief. We really didn't change a belief. We've got two contradictory beliefs inside of his mental system. One that says money doesn't exist, free money doesn't exist, one that says it does. Which has more energy? Probably the one that says that it does, because under similar circumstances, is he going to hesitate asking for the money? Not at all. He'd be the first one in line, right? Oh, I remember, I remember that. Okay? Yeah, okay. I know what's happening. I know what's happening here. And interestingly enough, when you have this kind of experience where you have, let's say, been pleasantly surprised, with an experience that contradicts a limitation, you might say, because this is a limitation, and pleasantly surprised, what are you going to do? You're going to want to share that with everybody, right? Not everybody, but most everybody. You're going to go home. You're going to go back to the office. You're going to be maybe even jumping up and down, and virtually the same three words will roll out of everyone's mouth when you confront, let's say, whoever it is that you want to tell. What are you going to say? What's, how, are you going to pre, how are you going to start your story? What three words are you going to use to start your story? You won't believe it. Yeah. You won't believe. Right. You won't believe. You're saying, hey, you won't believe this. And you're what? You're right. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> you want them to believe it. <clears throat> but you're right. They probably won't. Thing. It goes against their belief. It goes against actually. their belief that free money exists. And so they will interpret your story as being a fabric of your imagination or just maybe something you're trying to pull over on them. Whatever, whatever way they might interpret why you're saying what you're saying, they will find a way to rationalize it away so that they're not in a state of conflict by the fact that you're confronting them with information that completely contradicts what they believe to be true. You guys with me on this?
And interestingly enough, let's look at let's look at the state of mind. This is the critical factor here. State of mind. The relative degree of positiveness or negative energy that's rolling through our brain and body. Okay? Because essentially well, let's say eventually, by tomorrow afternoon, what we're going to learn about the nature of consistency is that it's really a function of your state of mind. Not specifically not a function, or how much money you accumulate as a trader is not a function of how much time you expose yourself to the opportunities. Not at all. It is a function of your state of mind. That's a big one. That's a tough one. That the amount of money you accumulate as a trader is not a function of how much time you spend exposing yourself to the opportunities, as most people think that it is. Now, the more opportunities I expose myself to, it would make sense that the more money I should be able to accumulate. And I'm saying that is, that is expressly not the case. The amount of money you accumulate is a function of your state of mind while you're trading. If you're in the most conducive state of mind to be making money, you will make and keep more money whether you trade at five minutes a day or five hours a day if you can stay focused in the most appropriate state of mind. And so the whole idea is that if you're not in the most appropriate state of mind, then again, don't trade. Yeah. It's like putting money in the bank. And that's basically what I meant yesterday. But let's look at the state of mind. What time is it, by the way? Okay, but let's um, let's look at, 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 at the state of mind that each one of these <coughs> which one of these beliefs produce. The people who believe that free money didn't exist and, and walked around that particular person, you could say that there are varying degrees of discomfort based on how crazy they thought the person was. The crazier they thought the person was, the greater the degree of discomfort. So you could take someone who really thought the person was crazy, and instead of just taking five or six feet, you could, there's a one-to-one -one correlation. You can even measure it, basically. How far away they would go out of their way and alter their path would be in direct relationship to the degree of discomfort, meaning the degree of negative energy that was in their belief about how crazy this person was. To the point where somebody might even just cross the street just to stay on the other side of the street. And so their experience of the situation was, let's say, close to, if this was terror, okay, and this is confidence, You could say that someone could actually create for themselves an experience of fear or terror. But well, that's not what existed at all. Go ahead, Michelle. Mark, uh, there's a little quote from Mark about the state of mind. <sighs> now, what we were talking about before we broke, we went on break, was that we were talking about various states of mind and how whatever beliefs we're operating out of in any given moment will basically control or determine what state of mind that we're in. In other words, the energy of the belief that we're operating out of, 